Hello and welcome. I'm Fernando, a GP in the UK. Today we will go through the guideline by the British Society for Hematology on the laboratory diagnosis of functional iron deficiency, focusing on what is relevant in primary care only. A link to it is in the episode description. If you haven't already, I recommend that you check out the last episode where I covered the laboratory diagnosis of iron deficiency. And in the next episode, I will cover the assessment of raised ferritin. So stay tuned for that. Right, let's jump into it. Whilst the concept of functional iron deficiency is both important and very relevant to us in primary care, reading the full gut line can be overwhelming. It's full of detailed considerations more relevant to specialist and secondary care. So instead of summarizing that in its entirety, I'm just going to give you a general overview. I'll take you through the relevant investigations, explaining each one in plain terms and linking it back to what we need to know and do in general practice. But first of all, what is functional iron deficiency? Functional iron deficiency happens when the body has enough iron stored but can get it to where it's needed particularly the bone marrow, where red cells are made. This is different from true iron deficiency, but the effect is similar. Not enough hemoglobin is made, leading to anemia. Why does this happen? Functional iron deficiency is common in long-term illnesses, like chronic inflammation, for example, rheumatoid arthritis, infections, cancer, and chronic kidney disease, or CKD. In these situations, the liver produces hepcidin, a hormone that blocks iron release from stores and reduces absorption from the gut. So, even if ferritin looks normal or high, the bone marrow can't access the iron, so red cell production is reduced. What should GP know about functional iron deficiency? Let's look at a very simplified version of the pathophysiology. And that is that chronic inflammation leads to a rise in hepcidin, which reduces iron transport, which in turn leads to iron not reaching the bone marrow. This results in anemia of chronic disease. When should we suspect functional iron deficiency? We should suspect it clinically if there is anemia in chronic disease, especially if it's not improving with oil iron. We should also suspect it, depending on test results. And let's now look at the list of possible tests that can be requested for functional iron deficiency, starting with the ones that we can order in primary care. Firstly, we have MCV or mean cell volume and MCH or mean cell hemoglobin. They tell us the average size of red blood cells and the average amount of hemoglobin in each red cell respectively. They're useful at the time of diagnosis and for tracking trends over weeks or months. However, they don't change weekly, so they're not suitable for identifying rapid changes. Then we have serum ferritin. This one we all know well. It reflects the amount of stored iron in the body. If it's under 15 micrograms per litre, that strongly indicates true iron deficiency. Ferritin is an acute phase reactant so it rises in inflammation and chronic disease. So, a high ferritin doesn't exclude functional iron deficiency. In CKD patients, a ferritin under 100, or sometimes even under 200, increases the likelihood of requiring further iron treatment. Also in CKD, values as high as 1200 may still be consistent with iron-restricted anemia. But we should not use ferritin alone to guide treatment, but consider it in the context of other tests too. Then we have transferrin saturation, which shows the percentage of transferrin that is actually carrying iron. Alone is not a reliable guide for iron therapy in CKD patients, but combined with ferritin and other tests, it can help diagnose functional iron deficiency and monitor treatment. Transferrin saturation can also be influenced by inflammation, so it's not a standalone tool. Let's now move on to more specialist markers of iron status, especially for functional iron deficiency, like the percentage of hyperchromic red cells, which measures the proportion of red cells that contain less hemoglobin than they should. 
is actually the best established lab test for detecting functional iron deficiency. Then we have reticulocyte hemoglobin content, which measures how much hemoglobin is in reticulocytes. It's the second most established marker for functional iron deficiency, and the value of less than 29 picograms suggests functional iron deficiency. There are other truly specialist tests, which are zinc protoporphyrin, bone marrow examination, soluble transferrin receptor, serum erythropoietin, and hepcidin, which plays a role in the pathophysiology of functional iron deficiency. What is the typical picture of anemia in functional iron deficiency? Well, hemoglobin is usually low or normal, often showing a normocytic, normochromic picture. Ferritin will be normal or high because being an acute phase reactant, it's falsely elevated in inflammation. Transferrin saturation is usually low, below 20%, despite the high ferritin. Transferrin saturation is reduced because of iron being unavailable. Serum iron is low, both in true iron deficiency and functional iron deficiency. However, total iron binding capacity is normal or low, whereas it would be high in true iron deficiency. ESR or CRP tend to be high in functional iron deficiency, reflecting underlying inflammation. And finally, functional iron deficiency also show that reticulocyte hemoglobin content is low and percentage of hypochromic cells are high, which is also shared with true iron deficiency. When should we refer to secondary care? We should consider referral if there is persistent or unexplained anemia, and we suspect functional iron deficiency because oral iron hasn't worked, if the patient is or might need IV iron or erythropoietin stimulating agents, which are managed in secondary care. If there is diagnostic uncertainty, like for example mixed deficiencies, or there is a high ferritin but the picture still points to iron deficiency anemia, or also if there is anemia in CKD stages 4 or 5, active cancer or complex comorbidities. And to end, let's remember that our role in primary care is to recognize the functional iron deficiency pattern, that is, chronic disease, with anemia, and a ferritin which is not low. To exclude other causes, for example bleeding, B12 or folate deficiency, chronic kidney disease, etc. Functional iron deficiency is treatable but IV iron and erythropoietin stimulating agents are specialist decisions. So that is it, a review of the laboratory investigations of functional iron deficiency. We have come to the end of this episode. Remember that this is not medical advice, but only my summary and my interpretation of the guidelines. You must always use your clinical judgment. Thank you for watching and goodbye.